Oh, and this is so cool. Uh, Holly and I just went to see Amy Sedera. She's a comedian, writer, actress, Saturday night. And this looks like something she Recording would have written. I mean, it's just amazing. You should be writing. He wrote this, not me. John Davis is a South Texas boy. Born in San Antonio, he lived there as a youth in the then undeveloped area of Chavano Park. Chavano Park, briefly moving to Guatemala City. Returning to South Austin during the waning hippie years and later to the developing fringes of Northeast San Antonio. After graduating from the University of Texas at Austin, he is settled in New Braunfels, excluding two brief stints living near Blanco and Deep South Austin. So he's lived all over everywhere. John's always been interested in nature and the outdoors, and while in high school, he began a lifelong interest in organic gardening. After living in New Braunfels for a bit, he was invited to a men's garden club meeting and later recruited. Contacts and volunteering with the group, the club, led to volunteering with the City Parks Department to help promote the first area water symposium chaired by Bill and Dolores Schumann and serving as a board member of Friends for the Preservation of Historic Land Park. Working with former New Braunfels urban forester Kelly E.B. I'm horrible with my names. John became familiar with many of the city's existing and developing parks. Kelly recruited John when Camel Trails Alliance was forming in 2013. About the same time, Jane Miller persuaded John to join the Lindheimer Nipsot chapter and later to become a Lindheimer chapter. Texas Master Naturalist with Texas Water Specialist Certification. He has participated in a few watershed cleanups and also attended a few Invaders of Texas workshops sponsored by Texas A&M Agricultural Extension. John also became a Headwaters at the Conell Volunteer from the program start. This is part I like. John has no free time. <laughs> He has a bad habit, I think we all do, of agreeing to help if he can when asked. A habit he's trying to break. I hope he doesn't. <laughs> he has a few scars, no known broken bones, all of his fingers, and is cap caffeinated but not medicated. <laughs> his paternal grandfather, for whom he is named, was a machinist, and his father was a builder. To this point, he has survived, perhaps by grace, being surrounded by and using a plethora of sharp, potentially deadly implements without serious incident. He does not run with scissors. <laughs> oh, you run with all this. <laughs> John. I, I started, uh, I have an older brother who's six years older than so, when I was a kid, um, when I was a kid, he was the one who mowed, and uh, we, when we lived in Shavana Park, we had like a probably half acre front yard, so um, he apparently never was inured to gardening or anything after that, so ever since he could got past that, he has never developed any interest at all in green things. <laughs> so, um, I was too young to do anything there, but we go to like um, the Garden State Park and all over the place, and um, we had friends in, in town, so we'd go and there would be like uh, four ornamental gardens, and the, at the time the, uh, the Arboretum and everything, they were really nice. And so then when I was about fourth grade, we moved to Guatemala and lived there two years. And we rented, so I never had to do anything. And I was pretty young anyway. So I got exposed to wonderful plants going through 
Right. You know, we did a couple of trips back and forth, so through Mexico and then Guatemala and all around Guatemala. We ran out of money because my dad was a builder, and the reason we went to Guatemala was there was a building uh, downturn in the early 70s. So he was uh, bleeding money, so he decided to uh, sell off the business and and go down to Guatemala because his, uh, his brother-in-law had taken him to a trip down there and he thought it was fantastic. I'm not sure if he wanted to take his family down there. I think he was going through a midlife crisis. <laughs> but my mother probably persuaded him that it was a good idea to bring us along. And so when we ran out of money down there, he began to come back so he could earn money. And my, uh, older, uh, my sister and brother I'm the youngest, my sister's the middle, and my brother's the oldest. So they were going into high school. And so uh, my parents thought, well, Austin's probably a good spot, and if they maybe they could go to university later on. So uh, they both went through uh, Austin High School, and I was raring to go to Austin High, but we moved from, from Austin to San Antonio, and I went to James Madison in San Antonio, which was a brand new school built like a penitentiary. <laughs> and it was the Northeast San Antonio at that time was really like, uh, they just kind of scraped everything and put up these thick houses that were really tightly packed. And, uh, and so we moved into a new house. It was a two story. It, it was kind of on a uh, slope. It's, very, it was very close to outside Loop 16 and you look at that area now and it's all built up, so it's not out in the areas. But we were actually about two miles from uh, Gardenville, the original Gardenville. Uh, and so that's where I got some of my first uh, interests in, in uh, you know, talking to people about organic gardening. Uh, it's a, it was a fabulous place, and uh, and trying to grow stuff in San Antonio. If you're familiar with Caliche, uh, we, we had, we had they probably brought in the topsoil, so it was maybe two or three inches, and we were growing, uh, trying to plant some shrubs, some uh, we planted some crepe hurdles and grass. And so that was the year it was like 100 degrees for 45 days or something. So I was out there uh, watering the grass, fertilizing the grass, and composting the uh, composting the clippings. The saving grace was my dad bought a brand new snapper um, lawnmower. It was fabulous. And, it, and, and that, that grass was water and the nitrogen it was just producing like crazy so I was mowing in it and I was like composting in the corner of the fence which was a wooden kind of basket weed fence and then one night it spontaneously combusted oh. over, like a big section <laughs> of the, the art or, you know the adjoining properties and I slept through it I didn't hear a damn thing and apparently my dad and the neighbor the neighbor came and knocked on the door and they were out there and, and try to put it out before the volunteer fire department came and, and make a mess of everything. So I woke up like the next, I think it's like a Saturday morning, and I went out and I, what was that smell? And so I around the corner and just kind of like, uh, so that's probably when I decided that high nitrogen fertilizers are probably not a good way to go, and I started uh, switching to organics and then and learning about you know uh, different ways to cultivate and plant and um, and through that um, I came across a method which is kind of like the predecessor to square foot gardening. Uh, if you're familiar with John Gibbons or Gibbons, he he, um, he has like an institute in California and he goes all around the country teaching uh, people how to grow intense bio intensively and um, one of the one of the main aspects of that is using the resources that they have which is usually 
they don't really have money to, for inputs for nitrogen. They're kind of restricted in you know, how much water they can use. So the technique is called double digging. So initially what you do is um, you figure out where you're going to build the bed. You, you take a shovel full of uh, soil, set it aside, take one of those forks, loosen up the subsoil, and then as you're going down the bed, you take the topsoil from the next part and you put it on top of the part you've loosened up. So that by the time you get to the end of the bed, you have loosened up the, you know, maybe anywhere from a foot to two feet of soil, which allows water and, and roots to penetrate. And as long as you don't pack that soil again, uh, you don't have to do any more work in the lifetime of that bed. You just keep adding amendments over the years and leaving, you know, the, the biomaterials left behind. And it, the tilt of the soil just keeps improving. So it's similar to um, like a prairie system where eons and eons, it's like the, the grasses grow, they die, their roots remain in the soil, and they, you know, they uh, break down. They keep adding, they keep putting nitrogen, yeah, nitrogen and carbon into the soil to increase the tilt. And then what happens when you uh, till it, you oxidize all those uh, things and you lose a lot of that carbon to the atmosphere. So where we have prairies and we're known for growing corn and soybeans and all that stuff. So all that, a lot of that topsoil is ending up in the, the Gulf of Mexico and a lot of the uh, chemicals and fertilizers growers are using are ending up in the creeks and the rivers and so it's kind of like we're mining that topsoil. It's, it's uh, the carbon content of the soil is bleeding over the, you know, the short period of time that we're doing that. So that's how I got involved with uh, a lot of these tools. Now I've, I've built uh, beds in Austin, San Antonio and the Bronfold and so there are different soil types. They all have you know different characteristics, but um, a lot of a lot of them are similar. They're very uh, low in organic matter, high in mineral matter or mineral content, and really not easy at all to dig in. So that's where my uh, my tool fetish started to get uh, get going is how do you how do you make this a productive system so I over the you know this is probably the collection of since high school so it's quite a while that was in the 80s it's a long time ago. Um, and some of them are a lot of them are mine but some of them are recent from Comal Trails Alliance because I kind of um, I kind of uh, research what we need, know what we would need to do, and uh, do some, figure out where to get them, how much, and our budgets and stuff like that. And the first time we did that, we just got out of the hole and were making some money, and so it was like a, a big victory. You know, I didn't want <laughs> to, want wanted something to last because at that time I didn't know how the organization was going to grow. If it was just going to uh, kind of go gradually up or exponentially up or kind of fizzle out and go down. So, <laughs> so now we're doing good and I'm, I'm, since we have more more volunteers than we have tools, I'll get to buy some more. <laughs> um, I group these two different ways. So one of the ways I think about them because I use them a lot is I'll, I'll group a bunch of tools in uh, what, what I'm, you know, what task I'm going to be performing. And so I set out like eight different ones, and the ones I, you know, I think about is building and maintaining beds because that's kind of like my foundation. And then now I do naturalist stuff um, and and do tree plantings and all kinds of stuff like that. So another one is similar to that is field planting. So that's not planting in a prepared bed, that's like going out 
in planting a tree in a park or something, or going down to the dry canal and, and planting stuff. The third one, which I do a lot, uh, the fourth one is similar. It's pruning, trimming, and clean up. Uh, the fifth one, which I probably spend more time doing this than most any, and that's the mulching, composting, and soil blending. So I'm a big composter. I've been composting for a long time. And I used to be a very, you know, systematic, active, you know, um, uh, productive oriented, like let's get this done fast. And, and now I um, am kind of like, I got, I got plenty of material. Let, it, let nature take its course. I don't need to work myself out. So um, I used to, I also have a mechanic, a gas powered shredder, which I haven't used in a while. I used to build compost piles using that. And I could get, before the mulch was at the uh, county site, it was over, they used to dump it out by Cypress Street Park. So I'd get horse manure and the mulch at Cypress Street Park and I'd compost that and I'd run it, you know, I'd run the stuff through the shredder, make a pile. But um, that pile would heat up really fast, and that brought memories of me burning down the fence. <laughs> Plus, there was a big scare about um, the herbicides that they were using in the hay. So, um, Gardenville almost went out of business because a lot of their inputs where they commercially compost um, was killing plants. And so, it was a big, big deal. So, I no longer. Um, I no longer, you know, go out and just collect it. Uh, and unfortunately, horses, it's like, they eat grass, it goes straight through them. It doesn't break down like a cow. So you got to be really careful. Um, the propagation and seed collection. So about the time I moved to near Alphys, um, I think we are like going through our third or fourth Drought cycle, so I got interested in uh, xeric plants. I planted a lot of xeric plants, which um, they're great when you're dry, but if you get clay soils and you get wet periods, it's like you can be deaf <laughs> on xeric plants. So uh, they have their place. And then uh, watering and fertilization, which for us growing plants, you have to know, I mean, you can't really do dry land farming or land propagation in this area. And the most recently is like wildland trail and clearing. So a lot of the trail work is um, is doing kind of some sur surveying first, figuring out what you want to do, what you want to, um, what you want to change, and then kind of confining finding your work to that area and maintaining those resources on site because those are very valuable resources. You don't want to have to spend effort removing them. Uh, there's a great benefit to reusing them. So that is like the classifications. And then uh, for the breakdowns, categories, which I'll, I'll go through the categories and we'll come back to them later, individual things later. But I've got a group by tools that are cutting tools, saws, there's a whole group of saws, chopping tools, striking tools, um, grubbing tools, cultivating tools, weeding tools, rakes, and then the stuff that really doesn't fit in any of those categories. Um, a lot of that is um, managing materials, so moving things. Or things like that. I say they can't hear you, especially with the wind and the okay. sorry, but, uh, train now. <laughs> so, with a lot of these tools, um, we get into okay. Everybody has their favorites. How do you how do you recommend tools to somebody? Um, I'm a big believer in why don't you try it out? See like it. Now, it used to be a lot easier to do that um, 
you could go to a hardware store, there used to be hardware stores, and you could find tools. You used to be able to go to really nice garden centers or nurseries, you could find tools. Feed stores are still pretty good, but um, a lot of the tools now that feed stores are getting and the kind of the, the big box stores have kind of pushed out the uh, the uh, hardware stores, but there are a few like specialty tool stores, which more so like in bigger markets like in San Antonio or Austin, you can still find kind of big stuff. But they're still there if you, but to consider, I don't want to spend an hour and a half driving to it. And for me, that's usually no. So um, ergonomics, that is, um, I looked up a definition and it's the study of people's efficiency in the working environment. So, yes? Can you talk into the microwave? Or, I mean, the microwave <laughs> is really, really loud. I can't Can hear I you are loud. loud. Okay. I can't better? hear you. That's yeah. better. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, with the er ergonomics, um, consider a couple of these things. Uh, the handedness. Are you a left-hander? right-hander, are you ambidextrous? Now, I am left-handed. We're about 10% of the population. And a lot of left-handers have to adapt. So, some things I can do ambidextrously. Some right tools are fine. Some, they're not so good. Uh, dexterity. Some people uh, yeah, the handedness, dexterity. Okay, do you have any? Are you flexible? Or are you kind of old and decrepit and can't do a damn thing with your hand? I'm still pretty good, but I'm getting a little. I bang my knuckles a lot, so that's that's uh, the strength. So, you know, are you are you like a 18 year old volunteer that comes and bends all my tools and I have to yell at him? Or are you, <laughs> are you like a uh, one of us, and it's like we have wisdom. It's like, okay, we don't have to do all this today. And you have size. So when I'm thinking about ordering tools, I've got volunteers that are like 5'2", and then they're like some that are 6'2 to 6'4". Some of them might be 98 pounds, and some might be uh, up there. I don't really ask. I don't want to be rude. But, um, length. That's more for the tool. So uh, one of my volunteers is like 6'2". I don't want him to have to bend his back. You know, you know, your back is really important, so that's a big thing. Smaller people can choke up on handles, but I try to get really long handles if I can. Um, the weight of the tool, that's really important, especially for things like um, when we first started doing trail stuff, I volunteered with a few things, and they bring these five pound pigmatics. And it's like, I'm not a road worker, you know, I only, <laughs> in the summer, I weigh maybe 145, 155, that's kind of my range. I, I can't work for an hour, you know, with one of those things. So we tend to go with like two and a half pounders. Um, you can use those all day. They're pretty durable. I mean, might take you three strokes to do what the five pounder will do, but you won't be having to stroke yourself. <laughs> um, the balance of a tool. So some tools are really well balanced, so they might be heavy, but it's well distributed. Some might be not so, you know, you might use them once and think, yeah, I don't want that one. Um, physical limitations or advantages. So some of us can do things and are restricted to do other things. And then like when I get the young volunteers, it's like, okay, how can I take advantage of these behemoths that uh, are really polite and they, you know, they're, we had, um, uh, I have shared two high school volunteers with Rosemary Melody, who you might be familiar with. So they would work for Come Out Trails Alliance and they would work for um, the Tara Paws, the, the volunteers that worked at the dog park. And so we had these two guys, and I really regretted 
when they graduated and went off to university because they were the politest two fellows. They would do all kinds of stuff. They were big, too. I mean, they, the short one was like 6'2". And um, <laughs> I wish they would come back, but I'm, I'm sure they're doing well wherever they are. So that's the Ergonox. Um, things for the handles. So handles, grips, or the materials. Handles, grips, and blades. So you've got pros and cons of all these different types of materials. Wood, fiberglass, steel, aluminum, rubber, plastics, and polymers. Uh, one thing about wood, you need to maintain it. Um, it's my preference. It's got some flex to it. It's light. Um, you have to, you know, you can break them though, and I have. Um, fiberglass, that's what a lot of road construction and housing construction, they're pretty indestructible, but um, they can degrade, you know, if they get nicked, the glass can be a problem. You'll, sometimes you'll see a lot of the road crew will take duct tape and they'll tape the handles, so that's keeping the glass fibers out of you know, their skin. Also, they transmit shock. So I've got a big, I don't know if I brought it, I've got a big long hoe that I took down to the dry canal to try out on the Arondo. Um, I cut all the canes and I was going to go for the lower part. So I worked all day, worked great. I got home and I had like tennis elbow for a week because it just transmitted all that shock. So um, it's better for like rubbing stuff, not for chopping. Uh, the steel, we have some steel rakes because they're really durable. Um, it's not as, it doesn't transmit as much um, shock as the fiberglass. It's lighter than the fiberglass, it's really durable. And we do a lot of rock raking. So I, I've got an aluminum rake, which I've used for years, but I thought, uh, okay, I really don't want to lend this to my volunteer, so let's get something a little more durable. So we went to that. The aluminum, like I said, it's a wonderful for some things. You don't want to really do heavy, um, heavy work with it. I actually broke the steel head on it, and I got a guy you know, to spot build it back together. So I've had that since high school. It's still going strong. And the great thing is the handle's really light. It's got a contour, not round, it's kind of oval. And it's got a really long handle. So I use that. It's one of my favorite tools. I use it all the time on all kinds of stuff. Um, rubber, like handles and things, are often, um, they'll use rubber um, cushions for like loppers and grips and things like that. You gotta watch. You know, you have to replace those periodically because they'll degrade in the UV. If you get solvents or something on them or, or detergents, they can break down the components of those. I see a lot of really nice tools that have really comfortable grips, and I steer clear of them because I know that they'll degrade <laughs> in about, you know, three to five years. It's just we've got really tough conditions, and uh, they're really great if you keep them don't use them very much and keep them inside in the shade or something, but, but they're not built for durability. Uh, plastics, some plastics are good, some are not. You just kind of have to know, um, have a little experience with a particular brand. Uh, the, 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 um, what makes them pliable often degrades in, over time and the exposure. And then uh, more resilient are the polymers. So a lot of the new tools are polymer tools. They're stronger than the, and more, more durable than the plastics. They're similar, but, uh, but I haven't had a lot of experience with them, and I'll just guide my time. So, and then the construction of a tool. So is it, a, is it simplicity or complex in design? That can be a factor. What are the, uh, maintenance requirements of something, and do you, are you willing to do that? Um, is there, will there be parts available? So a lot of tools now are um, they're just kind of manufactured, and they produce so much of them, they really don't, they're, 
they're not really built to be serviceable. They're, they've got a lifespan and then you recycle them or throw them away and then you buy another one. That's kind of how it works. Um, some of the other stuff, it's like the um, hand pruners I have from Philco, I think they, the original design was either like the 50s or 30s or something. They're still building them. You can buy every part on it is still the same part. I've replaced the blade one time. I've replaced the, the uh, little rubber bumpers. I think once I need to get new ones. Over time, if they don't degrade, they'll get hard. So it's like, and then um, the springs. I use the I lose the springs most of all. So used to be able to go to a really good garden shop and get replacement springs. Now I just kind of order them when I know what they are. But um, when the it's like a leaf spring, and when it gets more, the more you use it, it loses that elasticity, and then it'll be out in the weeds and clipping, and then you'll lose the damn thing. And it's easier just to have spares available. Um, the construction, the durability, um, durability and lifespan. So just because it's not built to last doesn't mean it's not a good tool. Uh, one of the favorite weeders I have is actually not built for weeding at all. Um, you can find them anywhere. They're really cheap. It's a, a cheap rock saw or pole saw. And generally, they've got really comfortable handles. The steel's better than most of the steels in most garden tools. They're generally dirt cheap because there's a lot of competition between, um, between you know, companies. You can find them uh, just about any hardware store, box store, uh, and it's uh, it's kind of a poor man's hori hori if you know what a hori hori is. <laughs> so I use those a lot. Um, I just kind of um, ran, just tried it because it was available. It was uh, I had found one at one of the our work sites, and it was out in the rain and really rusty, and I. I was waiting and I didn't want to go to the van and get something, so I just tried to put it down. That's pretty good. So, cheap. I, I'm, I'm good with cheap if it works. Um, so, that's the construction. The utility. Now, I was trying to think of why the hell I bring so many tools when I do go to a job. And then I realized um, because I, I did a lot of work with my father, so we um, most. Before he passed away, we were going down. We had houses in San Antonio that later became rental houses, but before they were rental houses, they had to be revamped. So um, either you leave your tools at the job site or you bring them with them, bring, bring them with you. So uh, that van, even when it was his, it was still loaded with tools that rattled all the time. So I think I've been trained, imprinted about that. And if you've ever been um, like at the bottom of a trail and realize that the tool you need is in your van at the top of the trail and it's a quarter mile hike up there, you soon decide, well, when I, why don't I take it with me? I might not use it, but it's better to have it than to have it to go back and get it. So that's where, if you've ever worked with me and you see me unload my wheelbarrow, I'd love everything and that came from, because I don't have a mule. If I had a mule, <laughs> I'd pack up my mule and do the same thing. But I've had that, that wheelbarrow since high school too, and um, I'm really happy it just fits my shoulders. I've tried out newer ones that are, you know, steel and got a higher thing, but they don't fit right. So I'm used to that. I'm going to keep it going until it dies. And it can haul a lot of stuff. I was out here one time moving uh, soil to one of the, um, it's like you've got erosion out by the road. And so there was a bunch of soil piled up on the um, driveway back there. So I was loading it up, loading up, and dumping it. And then I loaded one too many loads in it, and that the tire exploded. It sounded like a bomb going off because of the echo. And so it was only out of commission for like three days I had that tire fixed. <laughs> so that's going to keep going. That's one of those durability things. So utility is 
a tool's utility is a balance among the frequency of use, how well it performs compared to other tools, the number of tasks it performs well. And then efficiency is um, specialization versus multitasking. Some tools may be, do a single task well, other tools may do multiple tasks well. So when you get um, nothing wrong with a specialized tool, it will it often saves you tons of time. And that time is, is really important. That's of great value. So that's where I'd rather take a wheelbarrow full of tools that do something really well if it's not too much of an effort. Because if it saves me an hour to 45 minutes, uh, maybe more, just using something that's more efficient, that's something of great value. Uh, then there's like, um, when you think of tools, I think of like the standard, what you think of it, you know, what you think of a weeder is a standard. Uh, types of tools that are weeders are standard. And there are alternatives, improvised, like I've got to do something, I don't have what I need, what can I use to do it? And then modified. So one of the favorite tools I have is um, one of those, it's a short handled, um, it's a, like a tiller on one end or a grubber on one end and then a mattock on the other. They're like, they're very efficient. They're um, like 18, usually 18 inches, um, 18 inches long. And since I have, um, I have double deck beds, really easy to cultivate and weed and stuff like that. Well, the one, when I bought it, it was like one of those polymer fiberglass handles with a rubber grip. It's really comfortable until it kind of started melting and looking horrible. So I took the handle off. I had a broken um, ash handle from one of the picks that apparently you can't grow up some things out with them. You need those five pounders. You don't need the two and a half pounders. So you got to watch that. So I reshaped that, put it on that thing. It's a improved over what it was. Plus it was reasonably cheap. It took me a couple of hours to fit down that to fit in the thing. Um, the steel, it will last unless you're, you know, really hard on them. It, you know, steel tools last heads and things like that are pretty hard to get rid of. They um, like the I don't know how many times I've gotten to the bottom of my compost pile sifting and I come across one of my tools and I, oh, that's where you are for like eight months. And you've got a little rust on them, but you're, you live to fight another day. So we have the efficiency, we have the standard alternative improvised and modern tools. And then maintenance. Um, some people don't like doing maintenance at all. So don't get really complex stuff that needs maintenance. Um, I try to do cleaning, sharpening, lubricating, and repairs, and I check them, you know, you don't need to do it all the time, but you need to keep an eye out on them. It's, it's much better if you have a sharp tool that's in good condition before you go do a work job because they're safer. And um, some, of the, some of the people I know who've had accidents are usually, it's like, okay, you really shouldn't have been using that because it needed a little attention but you wanted to get it done and go home before five o'clock, so that's not good. And then um, under that, I will mention a few things that I've come across that are really good at those uh, issues. So cleaning, a lot of the, if you have rust or things like that, I use a couple of different things that are easily available. For cleaning, I'll use, um, there's a liquid barkeeper's friend, which has, uh, it is slightly acidic. The liquid is a lot um, finer. It's got a little abrasive to it. It'll take up rust off um, really quickly with, without, you don't really want to do, you don't want to really use harsh things that'll damage your tools. But I usually have that because we've got white enameled, um, sink and it gets 
black marks on it like crazy. So if you don't watch it, you'll just, and that's one of the things that works really well. And then Lega Shine, um, they have the, like the lime and um, rust, calcium rust. It's like a spray. That is really good. It's it's more gentle than Samovac, which works really well too. But um, it is the citric acid and, and surfactants that work really good at cleaning um, brushes. So I use like old toothbrushes, something like that. Sometimes brass brushes. Uh, I use a series of like the 3M. Uh, um, pads, you know, they have some that don't have any uh, abrasives in them and some that have little abrasives. HEB actually came out with a pad that I've used that's it's a little more um, aggressive than the, the pad without the abrasives. It's made with recycled plastics plus um, like the natural fibers from like Gabe's, I think it's like. And I'm not sure though how durable they're going to be. And one of the things I use with the, I, you know, when I wear out one of those pads, one of the things, the three pads, what I'll do usually is uh, instead of throwing them away, I'll use it in the bottom of a pot because it'll keep the soil in your pot and they last a long time. It's keeping them out of the landfill. Um, I used to use like a screen in the bottom of a pot. And the only issue with that was I was I, I grow a lot of citrus and things like that in big pots, and um, I was giving my citrus coffee grounds, and they were loving it. And then one day I looked at the pot wasn't draining. I flipped it over, and it was uh, filled up with baby uh, earthworms. So they were it wouldn't drain. So I thought, okay. I got to change this stuff. Another good, you know, another good uh, thing to use for the bottom of those pots instead of screens. You could is um, like if you have some of those uh, cut up, um, unwoven pots or um, uh, silt fencing stuff like that. When we redid part of the Ty Preston Memorial Library, um, I brought home a lot of those. The silt fence that was under the old mulched um, walkway. I still haven't used it. I've got tons of it. But um, there will be a job where I'm going to use that one of these days. But you know, I've got enough, more than enough to put in the bottom of pots, and it works really well. Um, getting off topic. Uh, the mild surfacants on the cleaning, as you're progressing and you get tougher, pro tougher things like. Um, Saw blades, I get a lot of pitch on the saw blades. And um, so you can use, sometimes mild surfacants will work on them. Sometimes you need a little stronger uh, solvents. Like the orange oil is pretty good at um, the de decumcifying saw blade. If they're really, really bad, I discovered by accident, I had some um, carburetor cleaner. It's like, okay, I don't know. There's like just a little bit left in the can. It's been in the garage for who knows how long. And I don't know when the next uh, hazardous waste pickup is going to be. And it'll probably be on a Saturday and I can't make it anyway. So I thought, why don't I try it on this gun to soft light? It worked fantastically. Um, I shouldn't have done it in the garage. I should have been outside because I think the major ingredient in it is tooling, which brought back memories of when I was in high school refurnishing, refurnishing furniture and stuff in the 100 degree heat with like all the solvents in it. Okay, this is probably not safe and I'm too old to be doing this. So watch out for those things. Don't buy it, uh, but if you have it and don't want to you know, throw it away, go ahead and use it up. Uh, sharpening used to, in the old days, um, the shop, we always had files, steel files, bastard files often for uh, you know, honing and, and sharpening steels. A lot of the steels, and modern steels, are a lot tougher now than they used to be. So um, around the 80s, the diamond files became, they used to be just for machinists and stuff like that. But DMT, diamond machine tool, 
started selling them. And I actually have one here that's from the 80s that still cuts perfectly. So they live forever. Your diamond's embedded in nickel, really flat, so you know, different grades. They're kind of expensive, mainly for buy them. Well, not so much now compared to steel files now. But um, they live forever unless you're really a brute and mess them up. But um, I've got quite a, you know, quite a selection of those. I use them all the time. You can use water with, you can use them dry, you can use them with water, or you can use them with a little, uh, with a little lubrication. But, you know, when, when you get all the filings on them, then you need to clean the files. So that's where that our keeper is a friend or let me try it. and you just that, you know, use it with your finger or paper towel or some brush, you know, rinse it off and you're good to go. So steel files, I've got a few of them. I actually, uh, we have some Corona saws that I decided I'm going to try sharpening those, get another year out of them for buying replacement blades. So I finally tracked down a little the feather saw, it's got, it's very intricate, and the blade on the corona has four surfaces. And it took me like 45 minutes to an hour to sharpen one saw, and I decided, you know the price of those blades is not so bad. So I'll probably keep that file, I probably won't use it, but, um, but I learned the lesson, it was a pretty cheap lesson to learn. So um, ceramics, ceramics are usually harder than steels. You'll see a lot of um, different types of those too. Tungsten carbide, um, I've got a couple of things that, that I'll use that, but only on certain tools because they're really aggressive. You can take off a lot of, they're fast, you can do a, take off a lot of steel to expose new surfaces, but you don't really want to overdo them, especially like in, you don't want to use kitchen, you don't want to sharpen them in your kitchen knives with those, you'll just destroy your kitchen knives. So, but for like axes, my little um, nata, which is a Japanese hatchet, um, a few like one or two strokes of that, it's razor sharp again. So they're using with caution and sparingly, they're great tools. And then abrasives, like um, the really fine uh, abrasive papers uh, that usually in the auto industry or uh, other shops, they can get like, when you get up to like 400 to 2,000 grit, if you have that a flat surface, um, usually you can put it on float glass and slide it or you can use it uh, if you have a flat surface to put in, uh, to stick, use a adhesive to stick it on a flat surface and use that. They are fantastic. It's really cheap way to get razor sharp uh, blades. For most of the tools, we don't need razor sharp. We just need enough sharpness to do the job. So that's more for really fine working stuff. So lubrication, I stick with the really easy ones. WD-40. It still works. It used to be really cheap, and then they decided to market it, so they got all these different varieties. But three in one, like uh, if you have a sewing machine, it's still the same. It still works great. Bow Shield, which was came out, I think, in the 50s, it's what Boeing uses on their airplanes. It is fantastic. It leaves like a really thin, waxy finish, which is waterproof. And I've got like a four ounce bottle that I'm almost to the end with. And I think I've had it for like 10 years. And then Triflow, things like that. Um, if you can't find them in a regular hardware store, just go to a bike shop because some of the best lubricants are in bike. They use them on bikes because they, they'll they leave behind um, steel and you know, you've got a lot, of, a lot of action going on in it. So some of them more, make a boatload of money selling them. Because bicycles will buy anything. So they always have a supply. You know, the amount you buy will probably last you 10 years. Triflow is really good. Uh, we used to use it on fishing equipment and it's really good stuff. 
And then for like the really heavy used things, I don't use it for much, but for like the, oh, sorry. You see that orange um, tree puller in the back? Yeah. It's got pivot points that when I get around to cleaning it, because I'm usually in the mud when I'm pulling it. So I'll clean that, let it dry, I'll put the lithium grease, which is waterproof, on that. And, um, and it keeps the, it's not really a fine, finely machined piece of equipment. <laughs> so it's kind of like an old truck. It works fantastic. Um, dirt cheap. Lithium grease is the adult place. You can find it anywhere. One of those little tubes probably lasts you the rest of your life. You can pass it on to your grandchildren. Uh, wood handles. When you buy tools with wood handles, they're usually lacquered. And they do that because they look really good, but it's not really great when they degrade the cover, leaving them out in the rain, which I do all the time. And so after a while, you'll want to decide to, like, or I do, sand them down smooth and put an oil finish on them. So I've used tongue oil, I've used um, teak oil, I've used, like, Danish oil. They leave a really nice, um, easy to maintain um, surface after that. And the hard part is getting the finish, the original finish off, especially now because a lot of those lacquers are not lacquer lacquer, they're like synthetic and stuff. So you might gum up a few pads getting that stuff off. Um, one of the other things for like really grubby things um, is those, I get the stainless steel scrubbies, which I use in the kitchen, so I always have them. I use them on my stainless steel because they're the same density as the steel. If you've got something really cruddy, like on your shovels or hose or something like that, which is a little uh, detergent or surfactant with water and that, you'll take them, take them down. So the wood handles, um, redo those. Now foams, plastics, rubber, synthetic materials, uh, keep solvents away from them, keep them out of the sun, and they're going to break down regardless. So uh, a lot of tools, the really cheap tools, they'll have really nice, comfortable foam handles. And uh, it's like, okay, you've got maybe three, four years of that if you're lucky. And then uh, you better wear gloves after that because they'll be breaking down the pieces. Now for if you have broken parts or neat parts that are worn, um, if you know the manufacturer of your tool, manufacturer, see if a lot of them have their a store or a distributor or something. They'll have uh, you can usually find the part you need and track it down to buy it. Or um, it's if if they have an online store, they'll usually have it. It might not be the cheapest price, but it's it might be in stock and available. So take it that for what it's worth. Uh, shopping and buying. Okay, ask yourself a few questions. Do you know what you want? If you don't know what you want, figure it out. It's easier to shop for something if you, don't, if you know what you want. Can you handle or try it before you buy? Um, that's one of the reasons I brought all this crap tonight. <laughs> so you can look at these and think, it's really great, I don't like it, the candle's too big, or it's too heavy, or I don't really need that. So, um, or man, that's, I've been looking for that all my whole life. I never knew one of those existed. How beautiful is that? And you can make me an offer. <laughs> um, are, do you have a particular, you have particular brands of tools that you like. Like, for instance, I buy a lot of Fiskars um, scissors and clippers, and they, they make a whole lot. They make tons of whole line, and they have different lines. So they've got like a professional line and a really cheap line, and the kind of mid level. They've always made really great tools. Some of them are just kind of bottom of the barrel, and some of them are like way too much. So those rakes, like the leaf rake and the garden rake, I've had since high school, and except for a rake in 
too many rocks in Panther Canyon, you know, breaking the brake head off where I had to get the welder to spot all it back. Uh, they're still going strong. That little plastic head on the leaf rake, who would think the leaf rake would live, um, shoot, how many years? I don't know, way too many years. Like over 30 years. <laughs> and I looked online, you can buy that replacement leaf thing if I ever break it. I was thinking, maybe I ought to be a little more gentle with it. And I uh, thought, hell, they've got a replacement. I can, I can just order it. So. <laughs> Having replacement parts and knowing that they're replacement parts takes a lot of fear out of breaking something. Um, if it's somebody else's tool, you don't really have that fear. <laughs> but uh, that's another thing. So locally, um, if you are lucky to live with a real hardware store or specialty tool store in your area, um, I don't know, there, there's like a shop on... Uh, business 35 at, um, and then the, the uh, hardware's it, it's like a lumber yard so there are two places but it's like they don't have a lot of diversity of things but for what they for some of the um, builders it's like they know that they will have that piece of equipment or they can get that through that dealer so if you're lucky enough to live in a big enough market, there might be some remnant um, hardware and tool dealers and stuff like that. For the rest of us, um, those days are gone. So, However, there's some really good hardware stores that have online, um, and you need to find out who they are, where they are, if it's shipping available, and that's where when I send out like some of the lists, um, I'll try to get that information. And um, nurseries and garden centers. So a lot of my really good gardening tools came from either Gardenville in San Antonio or the Gardenville, John Dongle's Gardenville in Austin. And if you've never been to the one in Austin, um, you ought to go to that one. It's a really great, great place. Um, feed stores generally have really serviceable heavy duty tools. Um, a lot of them now are, um, they'll have really narrow lines, so they won't have a lot, but generally they'll have some good stuff. Um, there's the King Feed. I haven't checked their tools yet, but I go to um, Tractor Supply, MB Feed, the Co-op. The Co-op was better when it was in town than now where it's out there, but you go to um, Seguin, there's some places too. And um, I check um, antique and junk stores and thrift shops and garage sales because when people move, they don't want to move heavy stuff. And everybody has them, they can get them, they think they can get them anywhere. And I might pick up something really nice that I can put it a little work and put a new handle on and save, well, probably not save any money, but have a good tool. Um, maybe big box stores. So if you're there anyway, you can look. Generally, you can look on their website. Um, sometimes now, since COVID and all the problems, you can actually find stuff in one of their stores somewhere, have it shipped either to you or to the store. So your store may never carry it, but you can get it. And generally, it's no shipping at all. So that's that's something to consider. Um, and then there are like the online specialty companies. Um, you could do a, a general search. So if you know what you want, you can usually do a general search and, and price, you know, price shop. And then you can always like the big box stores, like I mentioned. Now, I plan to send out um, some source information later when I update it, but I didn't get, get it done in time, so look forward to that. And then um, another thing I was going to do was the propagation, growing, and collecting. So you've got your tools, and uh, what are you going to do with them? You're going to plant stuff, silly. I mean, why the hell do you, why do you garden if you're not going to plant anything? So I do a lot more of 
I've always done collecting. So I was collecting native plant seed way before um, thinking of doing uh, nips hot and all that other stuff. So some of the stuff, like one of the hundred, the month of hundred degree days, I was walking the dog down by the river, and on this barren outcropping of caliche, in 105 degree heat was blooming yellow, orangey plant, and I what the hell is that? I got to have one know. So it was a minia. It's one of my favorite plants. And then when I grew it, um, since I have really deep soil and a lot of clay, it's really pretty fertile. It grew like a monster. So um, I've discovered if I grow it in dry shade with enough light, it blooms, it doesn't get as monstrous. I'm thinking about planting it in pots so I get control of the drainage on it. But it is like, it'll bloom all summer. Maybe not this summer, but generally. Mm -hmm. Share that with us. A little attention. And then um, I collected some clematis that was growing on a big um, ash down by the bridge at the river. And one of the floods took the ash away, which had the vine on it. So it's gone, but it, its offspring is in my yard, growing all over the place. Just about every one is a different variation in color, shape, size. I brought some out here. I'm not sure if they're ever going to make it out here because sometimes we have no rain and sometimes the deer chew them. But uh, I'll keep trying. So, and then at um, Cypress Bend Park. Before one of the floods, there were yupon, not yupon, possum haw hollies under all of the um, cypress trees. Well, when they cleaned up after the flood, they got rid of all the understory and the cypress. So it, if you've never been down there recently, I think I walked down there before Christmas is here. It looked really sad because there's no vegetation, native vegetation, right on the edge of the river, and everybody's kind of like, messed up the, the riparian area. It's all kind of massacred. So it's really kind of made me really depressed. But, hey, Christmas came. It got better. Um, so that, and then I, I collect seed and I propagate it. And um, some of my stuff comes out here because I don't know where the hell else I can bring it. I mean, I'll find it everywhere. <laughs> a lot of it goes to the dry come out. Um, I've traded some stuff with uh, uh, Susan Bogle had given me some seed from the Salvia Pistaminoides many years ago. And year, I think last year I propagated it. And so um, I it's, did really well in the little things I'm gonna show you in a minute. Um, and so I planted two for me, I brought some out here, which we're trying as an experiment in the over by the Bleeders Creek on the um, rocky wall, because I figured the deer would probably not want to walk on that thing. Plus, we the cages around it and use some of the we satch to kind of keep it till it gets rooted in, and then it's on its own after that. So that, and then I gave some back to Susan. So. Some of it went back to the type of stuff. I plan to keep propagating it and kind of dispersing it and trying it at different places, see if we can get that um, reestablished in some areas. So um, collecting seed, um, if, if you, there's something you want you, in the wild and you can identify where it is and know about what time it's going to be seeding. Um, write it down so you don't forget because it's like, okay, I, mean, I saw that somewhere. Where the hell is it? So that, that's kind of like one of those tools as a notebook is a pretty good tool. Um, the seed blocks, I'll show in a minute. Um, the uh, tools for blending soils. I bought a heat pad, which more for my vegetable garden than my native plants, but it can kind of extend the period that I can germinate seed. So that's, that's pretty useful. And then I recycle a lot of containers because I get, um, get little seedlings coming up all over the place. And some of them grow great in the standard 
the side of the box, it's like a little four inch or six inch or number one cans. Some of them, it's like, okay, they've got like a tap root, not long, they don't have any roots, they won't fit any of the damn pots, you don't want to cut the tap root. So I use recycled things, I use, um, I use like the half gallon milk cartons or the Humex one liter. Uh, HUB has a version of that, the, the juice boxes that are later and they're really tall and skinny and they've got mylar on the ends, they're really easy to convert. Uh, the mylar coffee bags are fantastic because you keep them out of the landfill for another use before, sometimes I just toss them on the fire, I think, you know, melt it and let that carbon go up and recycle is probably better than going in the landfill for 3,000 years. So recycling stuff, um, you got to uh, consider the seedlings, you got to kind of baby them. If, if you don't do some of the techniques I use where I'll put them with, you know, I'll just kind of, um, I'll do a method where I just kind of throw the seed and not worry about it, I'll forget about it and come back. And I'll be surprised, oh look, I, I didn't ever expect that to be there because especially like seed I collect that I forget to write what it is, where I got it, and when it was there. I don't know how this is, it's been here forever. Well, it, that's one of the things that I get great plants that way, it's really easy. Um, if you just let your plants go to seed and then cut the heads and set them out where you want them, you'll get pretty good success that way. I mean, that's what they want to do anyway, right? Uh, there is a method where when I want to grow something and know where it is, but I'm really lazy about tagging them, I use the, like, the, I'll cut the bottom out tin cans that I've already cut the top off. I'll put an area, you know, that's growing in, I'll put that damn can there so I'll know, oh, there's something there. And sometimes I'll actually write a label, not very often, but it's been known to happen. But that way you know where the hell it is when you're doing wildland stuff or stuff in my garden that's like, it takes care of itself. I really don't go to great detail that can take care of it. Um, there's the, the walk, the toss and walk away is one of my favorite methods. Um, the, the problem with uh, seeds is it's easier if you do it at the right season or you're not that interested in it, you just or get to that point where it's laissez-faire, like live or not, it's not none of my business. So that's why I come out here because I get the spread seed and it, it may live, it may not, but uh, it's up to God to figure that out. So one of the, let me get to some of these, uh, some of these, where did I So like the seeding stuff, so just out of luck, I discovered that if you have canning, the big wide mouth canning jars and you have a ricer, you might check the screens on your ricer to see if they fit your canning jar because I think I've got another screen at home too. So they've got different sizes. So if you are planning on um, packaging up and storing your seed for a little while, it's good to get it clean, dry, um, in something that you can label. So I go to like the, uh, I get like a big box of coin envelopes or something. This box I bought when I was still in the Men's Garden Club, which has been defunct for I don't know how many years. I've still got you know, some of them. But they're manila paper. You can actually seal them. I usually write uh, what they are, when I collected them, um, and that's about it. I mean, that's more than enough, right? And then I'll store them somewhere where I can remember where the hell I put them. If they're really valuable, I might actually put them in a canning jar, put the lid in, and put them in the refrigerator. But 
uh, things in my refrigerator, you know, if I don't use them every day, their chance of me remembering and is hard. So one of the things, like um, for tags, if you're planting your seeds and using tags, I'll get the um, Venetian blinds at like the Habitat for Humanity for a couple bucks, and I'll cut all. They're either like vinyl or aluminum, and then I'll use if they're vinyl, I'll use a Zebra Carpenter's pencil, which has a really wide um, lead on it, and it doesn't roll. So you know, it doesn't roll off your table. For the for the um, those, I usually use a um, either a pencil or a really good non-smearing, uh, you know, fine point or whatever whatever I have. So these are. These are what I've been using for my seedlings as an experiment. They were kind of expensive, but it was like a birthday Christmas present to me. So, um, and they'll live forever. Um, they're made in England. There's another size. Actually, they have like if you in a nursery, if you're a nurseryman, they make some that are like stand-up ones. But what you do is you mix up. Um, it's got to be a sticky soil, which so most of my plants are native plants, or they're going in my soils which have high clay in it. So I need uh, good drainage, I need moisture retention, and I need something, a medium for that to you know, hold together while it's germinating. And then once it's germinated, I can figure out which ones are going to make it and put them where I'm going to put them. So I'll recycle my soils. I'll usually go like two parts finished compost to one part recycled soil, and then I'll add my amendments. And the more I do that, the more additives that I've added to my soils is builds up. So like all that green sand or crushed, um, I'll take the lava sand. Um, and it's hard to get the lava sand. So if I can't find that, I'll get the lava rock. I'll go. Railroad plate, which is what the railroad um, rail sits on on the tie, I'll stick that in one of those um, and go get one of these guys. I'll stick the plate as best on like a Sunday afternoon on the porch with a beer because it's not the most fastest thing to do, but Put that in there, put the plate in, put your little rocks on and hit it with a sledgehammer and drink your beer. And it's not great when it's 100 degrees, but it's pretty nice when it's like 85 and you can watch the birds. And after about an hour, you've got enough to do tons of plants. And that, that crushed uh, lava is one of the best soil amendments that I know of. I hate perlite, I hate uh, vermiculite. Or like will float to the top. I don't use um, peat or any of that stuff. I've killed more plants, sticking, you know, nursery plants that I got from the nursery, going from the nursery directly into my soils. So I killed more bigger plants than the smaller ones. So when I buy nursery plants, I usually um, pot them up, grow them out a little bit in heavier soil, and then go in my garden. Um, because they survive and the other ones don't. Now, I've killed more plants overwatering them, especially this time of year, and underwatering them. So, like, it's probably like a 20 to 1 ratio. So, you go out this time of year and everything looks really, really bad and you want to water it, and then you forget that you watered it, and then two or three days later you water it again. Well, that there's water in that clay, it, it, it retains that. Um, that water, but the you know the plant looks really bad. But then you get all kinds of action going down in your soil, which will kill off the roots on your plant, and then you lose it. So just endure with the heat. So we got these. Um, I'll use like a we got a big baking sheet that I think my brother used under the oil pan for his cars because it never fit in any of our stoves. But you can put tons of these soil blocks on that, and um, 
it's a good thing to have. Now, the, the mat, um, you can control the temperature, which is pretty good. This is one of those pads I mentioned earlier, the HEV pad that has the thing. Um, so these, these are the tags. One Venetian blind, unless you do multiple plant sales, will last you years. Um, you have the sales and you offer them to people, then you have to go and find another Venetian blind smart. But I don't do as many sales since the men's garden flow at Thunder, so I just do the plants for this group now. Uh, you drink a lot of coffee, uh, these Mylar bags are a great shape for things that have tap roots. So if it doesn't have a tap root, you're just planting a short plant, you can cut it whatever length you want. But if you, um, like I bring a lot of um, the, uh, the pigeon berry. I waited for years, my neighbor had some, and I'm like, why don't I have pigeon berry? And I never had it for many, many years, and now I'm overwhelmed with the damn thing. And I discovered it's a really easy and tough plant because it's got a taproot and it takes abuse and uh, takes sprout pretty well. So I dig them up a lot and it's like they won't fit in the damn pot, but they fit in bags. They'll fit in these, that's the juice box. So you can cut off the top, make slits in the bottom. When you want to pot it, you just take shears or scissors cut up the side and peel it back. So I started doing this with tomatoes and peppers, so way before native plant stuff. And it works. You usually are throwing it away anyway. So I drink a lot of half and half in my coffee and sauces. So I always have you know those boxes. Um, watering this is one of the this is one of my oldest buckets with my niece who's now in her 30s. This was, I had a, another one. I had one of these in a smaller one. And the dog used this as his water bucket while well, he used the. And so I had to get another bucket from my garden because my dog was drinking all his water out of my garden bucket. So this is still going strong. I got a new one this year that's hunter green. So this will be kind of like, it'll be on its way out in 10 years. But I hope I survive that long. It probably will. So these are really tough. They last forever. You can haul all kinds of stuff. You don't have to haul just water. I mix a lot of soils in these. I'll haul rocks with them. They're like one of them. High utility, high value tool. Pretty cheap. They're, I mean, they're not dirt cheap, but they're, they'll live forever. So I got those guys. Um, this wasn't that cheap, but I mean, it'll work for longer than I'm going to be using it, so that's good enough for me. These will probably all pass on in my old age. Um, I haven't used them a lot. I'm still experimenting with them. So getting the soil right is a big deal. Um, now, these guys, I get a lot of my tools from the feed store. They got great stuff. This is like for feeding, mixing feed or feeding your goats or whatever. And I've had this forever. And this was tough stuff products. So it's really flexible. It's like low, uh, low density polyethylene, I think. I made the mistake. We had a worker. I had a bunch of um, Volunteers coming down at one spring break to do volunteer work, and uh, so Stacy in the park hit me up to chaperone these young Christian kids. So I had them rock, uh, raking rocks and moving stuff and moving uh, limbs and stuff in Panther Canyon. God love them, they loved it. So I thought, what great kids! Um, I hope you don't. You know, my thought was. I hope they don't really regret having come down to the brothels because they liked it. But I went to um, one of the big box stores. I grabbed a bunch of these thinking that they were this. They were not. They were like another plastic. They didn't last that two day or 
you know, it was like two days they were here. So they didn't last that long. I, like, I lost three of them, I think, cracked on the workshop. So the rubbery ones are great. I've got this one, and then i got this big one. I'll just bring my soil stuff up here. Yeah, that's what this one is. So I, when I'm making a lot of um, soil, I usually do it in my lower section in the yard and I'll stick out that uh, tarp and I'll just work on that so I can clean up afterward. But I've had this one, actually I've had this one longer than I've had the little one. Um, I got the little one working trails because I would tend to overload. One thing about the little one, um, you load it three times, it will fill up the wheelbarrow. Um, I was, before I had that one, I was loading up material in this to lift into the wheelbarrow. I had the habit of overloading it, and I thought, I'm too old to have back problems, so why don't I get a littler thing in me? And that has worked. That was good advice. So these are, they're not that light, but they'll live forever. One of the other things, I'll mix soils in them. Um, I actually, this time of year, I'll load them up with plants. I'll water them from the bottom. So it's like got tons of grasses that haven't got planted yet. I'll stick them in there because if you water from the top, the brick ball will, you think you water them, but that root ball really dries out and it doesn't absorb them. So you can sit them in there and let them soak for a while, pull them out, wait five days, maybe do it again. The plant might look bad for another month or so, but they'll, they'll survive it. So these guys, um, before, before I had those, I did a lot with, this is like my bitter end, the only survivor I have left, and it's already trashed. I need to get more. So, bus tubs. Um, used to be able, there's like an ace, uh, ace mart in San Antonio, a couple of them. Okay. So, they are great. Same thing, you mix soils, water. This is my high school built in an afternoon. Sifter, it lives out by the compost pile. I've been thinking it's on its last day legs for five years. It is, it is not going to make it. I use this to uh, winnow seeds in. Um, I soak plants in it. It was in the shed when we moved here. Uh, it's got a pinhole now, so it's not going to live long or it'll have other uses. This is like from a one of those fryers. It's great for fine sifting. It also fits on one of these metal, let's see, this guy. So you can actually filter stuff out in it. So you've got your, these are like the adapted tools. So if you're making uh, compost tea or whatever, or you're, you can just kind of Use that as a filter. I use it to find, like I'll, um, I'll run my, there's that big screen back there, so I've got the working pile. When it's time to start sifting, I'll run the material through that screen. The stuff that goes through that will go through this, and I'll just kind of stockpile it. When I need to make up really finer material, I'll take the finer stuff, run it through that, and that will usually go up in the mixes that go in my ceiling plants. So, getting to the back to the tool part. That's all. This is kind of the important part for me: the propagating and growing stuff. Because the soil parts, one of the things that I enjoy the most. Um, this is one of those cans that I'll either put the bottom up, or I might use that as a pot too. But um, the so one of the things about the rakes, my, it's a big 
thing with the trail building, but also I've been using them for my garden part forever. So my initial ones were, so I've had these forever. Um, still going strong. They are the aluminum ones with the con, it's not really an oval, it's kind of triangular with rounded edges. You ought to try lifting them, it's what you think. This one actually has a weld fixed on it. The tape is, I'll tape the tools when we do work days. So. Can we move the camera? Oh. Yeah. So these guys are the newer tools. Um, this one, well, I'll explain that. So this one is some of the ones we got for the Kamel Trails. You will notice it's a bigger tool than I need, but Don is 6'2". So you can get, this is Bully, they make great tools. It's got a fiberglass handle in this great deep, steep part. And it's moved a lot of rock. Um, this was my composting break, and it worked great until it started to die. And it all started to die, like I broke one time. And I could still use it, it was still really useful. And then like three months later, it lost another lost one. So the plastic got to a point where uh, it gave up, so lifetime. But I haven't gotten rid of it because I'm looking for a replacement head that doesn't cost as much as the whole damn tool does. Because I can unscrew it and put a new head on and it'll be brand new because the, the um, handle is worth it. Um, this is my latest, this is for grooming trails, plus I'm going to be using it on my beds. So it's like 18 inches wide, heavy steel, the teeth. So. Um, we groom our, our, bed, our trails so they flat and have a drainage. So they got like a 3% grade to them so they drain off. And periodically, because of the bikers, you got to go back and shave down the edges because they'll ride in the middle and compact the middle, push all the debris, the sides, and then the walkers will walk in the middle. So after a while, the drainage will go down the middle and it's not draining off the trail. This is one of the things that I, it was expensive, I thought it might save me using multiple tools. So I use this one. I used it a lot preparing for the dry, the sweaty giddy this year. It, I'm not, I'm not upset about spending as much money as I did for it now. So, these guys, um, Rosemary Melody's husband was a firefighter, and I worked with her in Panther Canyon way before any of the other like trail stuff. It was many years. And uh, when I started doing the trail work, he lent me his McLeod, which this size is was the National Forest um, recommended size. So it's like only four feet. It's got a really heavy steel head on it, it's for removing duff and brush and cutting through stuff. So when you're, you have to do a fire line, it's built for that. It's a really good tool. We actually bought four um, Coronas. The blade's not as heavy duty, but it's good enough. Um, the handle's a little, it's a few more inches. It's more comfortable, but I think this will outlast those guys. Um, if you it's a very useful tool. I highly recommend it. If you can find a little hand, longer handle, it's well worth it. Um, at the dog park, uh, Rosemary bought me this one because the dog park, if you've never been, they scraped the hillside. So um, what came back was we sash and mesquite and everything washed off the slope and then they exposed all these rocks. So we had all these rocks and mud and it was horrible for like three years. So I built a lot of swales moving rock using this. And 
Um, this is one of those tools that's kind of specialized, like this one. And this is more utilitarian. But this is another really, I use this a lot. So the initial trail building and clearing and really heavy stuff, that gets used a lot. It's really heavy. You only give it a feel. Um, they make different sizes of this. They make a one that's um, shorter. I mean, the, the head's shorter. They make some that are longer. They make a variety of those. Um, This is, lives out by the compost pile, and it's pretty brutal looking. It needs a new handle. I'm waiting for this one to die, and I will get a new handle on. But it's not worth, it's already really dry and old. It's not, gonna, it's not worth uh, cleaning up. It won't last longer if I do that. Um, but I, the head of it is forged. So it will not bend like uh, stamp steel. And it's Austrian, the head's Austrian. Handles, most, a lot of tools are made, handles, wooden handles are made in the US. Some now are made in Mexico, same, same woods. When the, uh, when the, this also usually lives by the compost pile. So I move a lot of material with that into my wheelbarrow or this or whatever. Sometimes this goes on trail building days too. When, when the church kids were here and we had the volunteer day, I thought, okay, I need something. Because this has needed a new handle for like, I don't know how many years. And I'm thinking one of these days that handle's going to break on with a new handle up, but it hasn't broken yet. And I didn't want to move rocks with it when those kids were here, so I went and got this, which um, it's a beast, it's heavy, and all I got it for was scooping up rock, putting it in this so we could load the river and do the rock. And that's basically what it does. It does it really well, and it's heavy enough to last quite a lot longer. Now, the hose. These are rope tools. So the thing about this company, the heads are all made with the recycled steel from the discs. Um, and they're heavy gauge steel. If you're carrying more than a few long handle tools, I recommend you can go online to Amazon. These little straps, Velcro straps, are fantastic. They're pretty cheap. You can get them in different uh, lengths. Um, but they're really good. Um, so Jane Miller bought me this um, before I did any trail stuff. And it was my very first rubber. And then I got the uh, Rosemary bought me this guy. And that was way before the trail stuff. So when we did the trail work, we decided we, I think I was using that other, like, um, not a great bow, but similar to that, on some bow. So I started buying tools later on. And this is my multitasking favorite trail building, gardening, Swiss Army knife kind of thing. You'd think it would only do one thing, but you're wrong because you can bow with it, you can actually weed with it with a point. It's got some edge here. You can actually rake with it. Um, these lot for tamping. I thought, man, those are great. So we got we got two of these thinking. That's great, but we probably ought to need these. So we bought two of these. I haven't used these hardly any at all. <laughs> so these those have rounded um, blades. This has flat blades. Don't get me wrong, these are great. Um, I used all, one a lot for the um, work in the Dry Canal Trail this year. It is more for cutting after something you've worked on something. You don't really want to be 
new building, new trail to this because you'll hit rocks all the time and you know mess up the blade. But it's heavier. It's got a wider head. It's probably better for looser soil than what we have. But it's a great tamper. So I did like I don't know how many feet of trail rebuild that had a big rut in it that I recontoured. I use this a lot, and one of the things that's really good at it is camping, and I don't have to buy timber. So then we have, like, the long handle is it's smaller than a great hoe, but similar design. I've had that forever. I still use it occasionally. The striking tools, um, so, I hardly ever take the sledgehammer to the trail unless we're breaking big rocks and know about it. But um, I use this guy a lot. Um, actually, this is probably one of the parks departments, and I probably ought to take it back to him. But um, they tend to, we tend to break the handles on them after a, a while, but you can actually replace the handles. Um, you got to be careful. The steel in these picks, you want to avoid the one made in China and India. They got really crappy steel in those. If you can find the ones in Mexico, you can find, hardly find any ones made in the U.S. anymore. But uh, that's where the like antique stores and stuff, you might be able to find older ones with good steel. So these are really durable. I think they have like a one of the big box stores has like a, if you break it, they'll replace it. That's why people buy them. So we chop out tons of roots and trees with this. This is a Plasky. It's from the design that's from the fire service. Um, I'm not a big fan of fire glass, but you need the durability. And it's a, it'll hit rocks, it'll mess up the blades. Um, I'm not adverse to using machines to actually kind of work some of the, the chips out and then finishing it with the others. But that's one of the ones where you will sharpen with. Um, so I used this too much on the, on the axes and stuff, so I had to get a new one. And it's amazing how this has got the two rods of tungsten carbide at the right angle. And a few strokes of that after you have the profile worked out, we'll sharpen it up. So um, these are not pretty tools, but they are they do the job. Steel's not great, it's a heavy thing, but it's not a finesse tool as well. So if you need to chop out, a, chop out roots and trees and stuff, you need one of those. The, the finesse tool is one of my favorites. Um, this is for like, I do a lot of cutting stuff down and chopping it up and moving it. So I was using um, the, this year I've been using an electric chainsaw, but before that I was using uh, Coronas. So we'll get about three years out of a blade and I'll replace the burlap blade. If you keep them clean all the time, you might get another year out of them. If you loan them to high schoolers, you might get less time out of them, especially when they use them as hatchets. They're not the brightest kids. Um, but I used to, when I cut the junipers, and I used to use a hatchet to beetle them or, you know, loppers or whatever. But I bought this, which is mine. I don't loan this to anybody. It's probably way too dangerous. But it, Silky makes it, it's a, their version of a nata, which is a Japanese um, hatchet. So they issue this to all the urban foresters in Japan, and it's got a rubber handle which is replaceable. It's actually one piece of steel. And this got, has two bevels. You can get one with a single bevel, but that's where that left-handed, right-handed thing comes in. The bevel was for right-handed people. Not, I better get the, the other one. No. But I have chopped through tons of juniper with this, and then I'll use the 
one or two strokes of the carbide, or usually I like the diamond uh, homes on that. This is higher quality steel, and I want to keep this going for a while. But this is where the time efficiency comes in, because with the loppers, um, I can probably do three, three times as much work with less effort with this than the loppers. So if you lop it, you know, lop it enough, you drag it where you want to put it, cut down, spread it out. Or you'll load up the tarp, drag it, spread it out. You get that efficiency. So the, um, the loppers we have, I picked some of these up from job sites and stuff. Um, this one was what I used forever until I lived it to one of those high school kids who are brutes. And I didn't think you could bend. And it's still, the blade is still great on it. I keep it because I lend it to high school kids, especially the new ones. Um, Fiskers, like these are two different versions or about actually the same, but uh, you'll see a lot of these. The problem with these is they're not the greatest. Uh, the steel's not the greatest. People will over chop with them and mess up the edge on them, and there's not really adjustment to them. But I mean, they'll work if you, that's all you got. Uh, I'm going to probably give, this one's broken, I'll probably give it to, I might recycle it in some way. These are what we bought for the trail. Um, I purposely got the longer handle um, so you can reach out and clear the corridors. You can get them in all different um, lengths. They're, they're not as light as you'd think, but lighter than they should be. And the blade will probably live forever. Um, you can get, there are different brands that you know, do these, I'll send, send a link to all the ones. These are Baco, B-A-C-H-O, I think, which I think is French, but I'm not positive. The steels in a lot of Baco products are, um, they're uh, sweet from Sweden, I think. Sweden makes great steel. Germany, Austria make great steel. Japan makes great steel. China, a lot of tools in China are crap. Um, Steel crap. Mexico makes because of the Germans, I think, they make great steel. And the problem is uh, the tool's only as good as the working cutting part on it. So these I've had forever, I don't use them. So these are Felcos. I need to get rubber bumpers because they oxidize. One time I used them, I use them for my roses, but most of my roses have bit the dust. But when I was cutting the gust room and I had to crawl under through it. These were too big and so I could crawl through these and they weren't great. Um, since then I've cut all that like thousand, the gust from under that big oak tree, I don't need little ones to crawl with. The hand ones, so these are mine from high school. I had, actually my dad bought had another one that were discounted because they're left-handed, who buys left-handed clippers. But these are articulated, and I've replaced a couple of parts on them. My sister, I made the mistake, she's left in it too. I gave my next repair to her. She does not appreciate really good tools. I visited her one time, they were in the garage, all rusty and cruddy. So I cleaned them up, gave her kind of a look, and left them in really good shape. So she's probably taking better care of it since this is what we bought for the trail company. For come on trails. These are Baco too. These are a lighter, like a polymer. They have a little rubbery grip. I'm not sure how long they're going to last. Similar design, replaceable parts. These are, you can buy them in, uh, this is the ergonomics part. You can get these in small, medium, large. These are medium right-handed. You can get them in left-handed too. They also have different styles. The, um, for sharpening, I mentioned the diamond files. I've got tons of these in different grids. Um, I've got some that are actually round. We have serrated um, things. So, got the lo big loppers, little loppers, the saws. I've had, 
I don't use these on the trail, but I've had them they're good for, you, need, you don't need a leopard, but you're too big for like a clipper. So they're really handy, they'll fit in your pocket. You can get them usually in straight blades or um, curved blades. Tons of people make these styles now. This one is Velco. Silky makes really great saws. That's who made this and the pull saw. This is another Velco. Uh, I will probably buy a printing saw with the same blade that I use on the pull saw because a lot of the arborists actually use those brands and you can I think there's a place in Seguin you can actually drive there and pick it up if you need it right away. Um, I've had these Coronas forever since high school. I don't use them much. Um, they'll need a new spring. When I buy the new blades for the saws, I'll probably ask them to throw in a spring too while it's shipping. You give them a little sharpening, they'll live another, you know, 100 years. I, I'll use them for like when I'm deadheading. I'll go one like one rough pass and go in and clean up with the smaller cutters. This is a company called Klaus. Um, this is like a tin snip or metal snip. This is the second one. I wore out the first one and they redesigned it and they made it worse. So be careful about reordering something and that they update it because it might not be good. Um, they put an adjustment for how wide it opens and it pinches. This one, the design now pinches you. So it's like, I can't we'll probably donate this one. Um, this is one of the fail, you know, it's kind of marginal fail design. I haven't valued whether I need it or not. So my favorites, which have a limited lifespan, unfortunately, but they're pretty cheap are the Fiskers. They really simple design. They are, you can't really re-sharpen them. They have a serrated edge on one edge and a flat edge or a, a regular edge on the other. And they're coated. And theoretically, you could sharpen them, but you wear that coating off. They don't cut as well. And then they wear down. So I keep my kitchen ones in the kitchen and they get a little dull, they go in the garden or in the workshop. And I try not to use my kitchen ones in the garden because I'll be like cutting sandy grass and rock and stuff and it's not really good for the edge zone. But you know, for limited lifespan, it's a good tool. Um, some, of the, some of the other stuff, um, I know I'm going long, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so, these guys, these are my most used, this is my most used tool in my garden. Uh, yeah. um, I do everything with it. I dig, I cut, I edge. Um, it's fantastic. This is my, probably my best tool for planting. It's not the standard, this is a border size. It's not the big one. I've got a big one. Uh, I never use it. When I double dig beds, I'll use the big one, but I, I never use it. For Once your bed's done, you don't need to dig that deep. So I'll plant a lot of stuff. If you've planted anything out here, you <laughs> basically know what my soil is like. If it's wet, it's really sticky, it'll stick to everything. And you gotta scrape it off your tools. If it's dry, it's like adobe without the, enough straw in it. So that's where these heavy ones, these are forged tools. I've got, um, originally I had the stamped steel forks, which most everybody has. And the problem with those is they'll bend, so all the tines bend all the time. So I've had this since. This, this probably came from a this and this. I didn't start using this until, because um, I was always using this guy, until like now my beds are cultivated. I don't need a 
big honking thing to plant a plant. So, well, this is enough. It's got enough. Uh, you can't really dig a lot in our soils out here with shovels. So, this guy is, well, they call it a poacher spade because poachers used to poach rabbits with it. But these guys are English made. Um, the standard diggers, I'll just point to them, but like the sharpshooter or drain spade, that's what I grew up with. Everybody used that to dig holes because you couldn't use a shovel. Now the thing with shovels, shovels are broader headed. They're made for moving loose material. They're not made for digging, except for like firemen. And they don't really dig great holes here. They grow up good in sandy soils in the west. So the spades are, um, are the forged ones are really are good steel and they'll live forever. That one with the curve to it is for trenching, but it's also great for um, planting trees because you can use leverage. They can break up that, that soil in the bottom of the wall. Now, on the end are some of those crappy um, forks. I Actually, on one of them, I, I cut off some of the tines to make them short and shape them, and it's great to build a cultivator. So if you need to just kind of cultivate your soil, it's a great little tool, except it's usually in the back I always forget about. Um, these guys, okay, trail, this is actually, although I claim it as my own, it's really Come Out Trails Alliance, and we got this before our first sweaty Yeti trail run of Panther Canyon, which I used it, I was in there for 200 hours cutting uh, leaves or limbs. And uh, so it extends. And uh, these are hard to find now. Uh, but I didn't get the really long one because we don't need to clear that much. Plus, at the time, we had an assistant ar uh, urban forester who would do all that work and get paid for it with tools. So I let Adrian do all the dangerous stuff. And I went back and did the finesse stuff, but sometimes he wasn't there to chaperone me, so I had to use it. It's, but I use this all the time. Sometimes I will use this instead of the little Corona. And um, it's a fantastic blade. They'll last. Um, I'll cut really smoothly until they don't cut anymore. And the reason I had to replace a blade was I, I was over in business stuff. I got it bound up in a tree up in, or limb up in the tree. And coming down, it snapped the blade. So I had to replace it. But I thought I was going to get another six months to a year out of that blade, but it was no more. Um, I grew up with these guys. They work, they don't work that great. I don't recommend them. Um, the F2. Uh, there, that's what they are. We use, um, for some of the water stuff, Dram used to be a really good company. Um, since now, they make most of their stuff in China. Not so good. Um, one of the things I've got, like a, I They still make some good stuff. So the good stuff, instead of China, China, mainland China, they make in Taiwan. They used to make them in the US. But I had one of these uh, breakers, I don't know, 30, 35 years, and then the face cracked. It still worked, it didn't work great, but finally replaced it. And I got a, Dram made a uh, shutoff valve fits on the end of the hose that is really good for that. So this is pretty good. Um, what is that? It's a dram and it's a cutoff valve with your thumb. 
So you can adjust the flow out of it. I used to use those um, those wands, but they break. And then you buy them and they break and they buy them and they break. Problem with, I don't know if it got in here. So this is one of the plastic things I've got. The brand's a good company. Maybe I ought to try the plastic and see how it works. And it will probably work, but the problem with it was the same, they have the same line, and this theoretically fits on this, but they have cuts through the threads on two places on this, and also on this. So what happens is, it'll be spraying, and it'll line up, and it'll shoot your thing off. So don't use this with one of these. These are decent, but not great. Um, I don't recommend them. This, if you put just a regular threaded cutoff, it works fine. I don't know how long it'll last, but I think I've had this about five years now, so longer than I expect. Um, tons of different, I used tons, like that probably came from a thrift shop. It's from like one of the coffee things. I usually pay a couple of bucks, stuff like that. Um, if you buy it, if you can find it retail, it probably goes like, I don't know, pretty, pretty much. Um, I've had these guys, which are measures, so I use these for measuring or proportioning or something like that forever. I've built sand castles in the coast with them. Um, I got them in a, like Tuesday morning or someplace like that. They're kind of expensive, but they'll last forever. I think you could probably, I mean, they're restaurant stuff, so they'll work. Um, the, the big orange thing is actually the cities on loan, and I'm probably the only one that uses it. I think they've loaned some out here. We pull trees out with those. The wheelbarrow, mentioned that. The shears, everybody's got those guys. The, and the harbor freight, and the harbor freight big dustpan. Oh, I use the harbor freight dustpan all the time to load up the tubs. Or if you don't need to load up and move stuff, you scoop it up and fling it. You can get a good fling with them. Get the, if you can find the better quality ones, get those. I got some that are thinner. They're good enough, but not great. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything. I got a lot of different types of weeders and things that I use for weeding. So like this is an official Dutch, one of the Dutch ones. A lot of Things I find really useful, I use out here all the time, is like a sheet rock hammer. Uh, different, my sheet rock knife. When you need to pull pecans out, it's Lyman's. If the soil moisture is right, you can use Lyman pliers, they work pretty good. Um, putty knives are great. You can get like flexible or flat. I use offset trowels. So the steel in the masonry tools is much better than garden tools in general. Usually cheaper. Usually have really comfortable handles. Um, if you lose them, it's not a big deal. So they're not, they don't win. They don't. What do you use those for? I do a lot of weeding with them. I'll dig with them in my beds. So I don't dig like out here where it's rough, but if it's been cultivated, I dig great in beds. I, I'll cut around, cut roots and stuff out of them. So they're highly recommended. I weed out here with them. Uh, and one of the specialty stuff we use on the trail to judge grades, you need two people for this, is a clinometer. So we set our trails at for drainage, and what you do is you get another person, you zero out with their height, and then you can use them as like a rod. So you tell them, okay, go left, go right. So it's better to be the person operating this than the little lackey that has to move around. Them. But when you get your grade right, you set a flag, you know, um, you'll stay on one side of the trail, you don't want to mix them up. Um, I use Sometimes I check uh, new people with a spirit level. It's also good to figure out a 
good gauge of width of your trail. So if you got new people, you want to try to keep them. Don't let the trail go too wide. The width of the trail go too wide. So that's a good check. I used these guys heel rules for um, setting seed, setting lines in my garden, and um, also sometimes on the trail stuff like that. So that's generally. Uh, if you have questions, that's probably more than enough that you want to know. If you want to. Um, when we yeah. help you put all this stuff in the car, we can hold them and look at them. Yeah. They have an astronomy class yeah, yeah. coming. Oh, and, uh, oh, no, this has been great. Well, well if you want to, um, I'll, I'll offer to let you, you know, come take a look at these things. And if you can help me move them down toward my van afterward, that'd be great. Yeah. But I know I went long. And I'm sorry. But, um, no, it, it's it was one of great. my things. So, it was good. You made me come out in 100 degree heat. <laughs> I'm going to make you yeah. work Aaron. for it. Yeah, thank you. I've been looking for this forever. That's what I'm going on for. I need to turn this off. Well, I thought you would...